right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Legend Sports and Amplify. And we're talking baseball history and Negro League history, collecting card art, you name it, on here. And uh, I'm really happy to have on today author Jeremy Beer. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are uh, you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. It's uh, middle of your day out there. You're, in uh, Arizona say I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to, to come on here uh, I only got to talk for about a minute before we got started here but uh, I told you a little bit about why I'm doing this and 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 trying to put uh, context and backstory and and a lot of authors and researchers and, and historians have done a lot of work for many years to keep these stories alive and and um, uh, you know many for for decades some of them that if, if they you, yeah. you, I wonder sometimes if they had not where would we you know where would all this conversation be today right so yeah. but you uh, you've you've done a book that I think people need to hear uh, about it, uh, it it's, it's a, a player Oscar Charleston that I think the title of your book he, he certainly is one of the most uh, underrated underappreciated Hall of Famers and eagerly players out there so we're going to talk about that um, but I do like to hear people's origin stories. I, I told you Dr. Brunson gave me that little backstory. I, I think it's cool. It's superhero. It, it's, it sounds, uh, uh, you know, sounds right for this because uh, these, these stories are, I think, are important and they're, they're big and they're kind of epic. Um, and so what is, what is your story? Tell us how you got into writing this book and a little bit about your background. Yeah, well, I grew up in Indiana. Um, uh, north central Indiana, a little town called Milford, and big sports fan. And frequent conversations with my friends, my father, about best you know athletes ever to come out of the state of Indiana. Uh -huh. Larry Bird and Oscar Robertson and, you know, who, who name uh, any number of other people in football and, and uh, baseball and basketball, Gil Hodges, Carl Erskine, people like that. Mm -hmm. um, but one man's name who never came up was Oscar Charleston. <laughs> Nobody knew anything about Oscar Charleston. I didn't know anything about Oscar Charleston until I was reading uh, Bill James's uh, list of the 100, his new uh, historical baseball abstract. I think it was published around 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And he gives his top 100 players of all time. And so, okay, that's cool. Let's go through here. Babe Ruth is number one. That's pretty, you know, it's hard to argue with that. Uh -huh. I think. Honus Wagner or Willie Mays is two, and the other one is three. Great. And number four is some guy named Oscar Charleston. And I just, <laughs> I couldn't believe I had never heard of the fourth greatest player of all time, and I was skeptical, you know. But Bill James was the last guy to traffic in, in BS. So you, you know there's going to be a good argument. He makes a, a, a an argument in, in the abstract for why he has Charleston place where he has him. So I did a little bit of research, found out Charleston was from Indiana, and was off. That's the origin story. I mean, I was, I was hoping somebody would write a biography. Um, I was, I would look around online for information about him and it was very um, telephone game-ish. You could tell that somebody had said something that something, it kind of gets garbled along the way mm -hmm. and he gets mixed up with other players and just kind of mythological stuff, mm -hmm. you know, not very historical. Uh, so you don't know what to trust. So um, yeah, given the kind of information poor environment about him, I finally <laughs> decided I would just try to write a biography of the guy uh, myself and it was a very rewarding thing to do. Awesome. No, I appreciate that. Uh, so how did you go about doing the research for it? Because I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, there are probably, you can count on, certainly on uh, your fingers, maybe some toes, the number of authors and researchers that have been at this for a long time. And, and you know, you take somebody like Phil Dixon who, he yeah. literally has hundreds of recorded conversations with uh, many of the players who played in the Negro Leagues going back uh, decades. That he, he started doing this, I think, you know, back in the 60s or 70s even, that he started talking to these players. So many of them were, um, you know, still still with us at the time. It, it's how I got into it. I mean, um, I, I, I worked uh, when I first got out of college with the Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania. And they were AAA team for the Phillies at the time. So Reggie Jackson sponsored a Negro League a benefit night for the Negro League Players Association in 1992. And I thought I knew baseball history. As a kid growing up, I was a big baseball fan. My, my father, my uncle, you know, everybody in my family. And 
I, it turns out I only knew half the story. Uh, I, I knew nothing like you're saying about any of these guys. Um, right. and, and I got to meet many of them. Uh, Buck O'Neill, uh, Jimmy Crutchfield, Josh Gibson Jr., Lester Lockett. There were many of them there. Probably, I think it was maybe 18. They made a card set out of it, which is very cool. But yeah. um, once I heard those stories, I was thinking, boy, oh boy, I got to find out more. So I've been kind of hooked ever since. It's been almost 30 years. I've been, <laughs> I've been doing whatever I, you know, my amateur sleuthing as well. But um, so I, I get it. There's not a lot out there, and and even when you talk to people, you wonder, like you said. Um, what are you? What is? What is the true story? Right. I mean. Yeah. You, 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 to, you, you have to, to evaluate. Deal. Yeah. The credibility of the person you're talking to. Right. Right, because things get embellished, and that's one of the things that makes it very, very difficult. Because, you know, uh, well, one one thing I think uh, maybe I'll get your thoughts on this before we start. We we'll talk about the book, but Baseball Reference came out with the fact that um, now they were going to add the Negro League statistics, and yeah. most people were okay with that. But there was a lot of pushback um, mm. from certain circles who just were like, wow, there's no way. I mean, these guys are playing their church clubs, you know, teams and the firehouse yeah. team. How could you count that stuff? First of all, you know, those stats are not what's being counted. But but the yeah. um, I, 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 I understand, you know, but when yeah. you look at the body of work, they, you know, these guys were not playing in the Negro Leagues because they weren't good enough. They were playing there simply because of the racism uh, at the time. Um, the color of their skin kept them there. And so, um, you know, anybody who was playing at the time in management, baseball players, they all recognize these guys as, as uh, certainly, you know, contemporaries of theirs. And, and so, yeah. you know, uh, but then, like you said, the, the stories that you hear, the 900 home runs by Gibson and Cool Papa Bell could turn the lights out, you know, be, and get yeah. in bed before the room got dark kind of thing, uh, which are, are great, but it does tend to kind of water down what the story is. So, so what, yeah. what do you, so give me, give me your thoughts on, on that announcement baseball reference made about the Negro Leagues are major leagues. What, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Um, I, I, there's no question that most of the time, <laughs> you know, most uh, major um, black baseball leagues were were major leagues. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we shouldn't evaluate the statistics mm -hmm. from that we have from those uh, leagues um, as rigorously as we would examine the statistics from anything else. That's, I guess that's how I would look at it. I do think the Negro National League, Negro American League, and a couple of the others that were shorter lived were every bit as good and probably mm -hmm. certainly better, maybe we should say, than the Federal League, which we have considered a major league, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a very long time. So from that perspective, it's eminently an act of justice. But it's totally fine to my, in my mind to ask, and I mean, I, I want to encourage a sort of kind of uh, scientific skepticism among mm -hmm. people like okay yeah investigate for yourself because what you'll find is that the best the top half to two-thirds of rosters on the major negro leagues teams were every bit as good as mm -hmm. uh do, do all the investigating you want with as skeptical an eye as you want you're gonna find those guys were as good as um mm -hmm. as the players in the in the national league and american league mm -hmm. it is true that the bottom of those rosters would, would be equivalent probably to triple a double a kind of mm -hmm. talent sure. i think uh, there's just were just there were um, the number of teams per black person in America. That ratio is different than the number of major you know, National League and American leagues per, per white person in America. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were more black teams uh, in a sense. Well, not in a sense. There really were when you count the NNL and the NAL. So that's just the reality of it. The bottom of the roster may not have been National League or American League quality, but the middle and top. Mm -hmm. Definitely were the top was as good as the top was anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so and nobody, I agreed it. Yeah. And no one is saying that they all should be in the major leagues. I mean, yeah. uh, <clears throat> but by the same token, uh, and Gary, I had Gary Gillette on here a couple of weeks ago. He made a great point that um, you know no one's going to take away from the fact that probably a third or more to forty percent of major league rosters shouldn't have been in the majors. Had the Negro Leagues yeah. been integrated? Well, that's right. So if you had if you had integrated the, right. the exactly black and white talent together mm -hmm. and say in the 30s or four, uh, 20s or whatever, yeah, exactly. You mm -hmm. you know the bottom quarter or third, or whatever it would have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the journeymen who were in the baseball reference today with a 210 batting exactly. average. Exactly. 
uh, would not have, you know, they never would have seen the light of day with the, mm. with and, uh, uh, yeah, Austin, whoever it would be. And the other thing I had, uh, Adrian, uh, Professor Adrian Burgos on, uh, and several others that have talked about, uh, Rob Ruck talked about the Caribbean mm -hmm. connection with the Negro Leagues, and uh, there's some of that with Oscar Charleston for sure, but the, um, mm -hmm. the fact that the Negro Leagues were integrated, they were that pipeline of how many Latin players, certainly from Cuba, Dominican Republic, came into U.S. baseball uh, over the years. They were already integrated. So the ratio of, of <clears throat> players, certainly in the Negro Leagues, the talent was uh, was right. was there. You know. So now I will say this again. I want to be. I guess I, I, the last thing I wanted these conversations to be just dominated by kind of like a. Um, you know, and misplaced political correctness where you can't ask questions. So I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine with encouraging skepticism. Mm -hmm. And it is true. This is true. Uh, Ra, not Rob Ruck. Um, Pete Simkus. Uh, Scott. Has a really good book. Scott Simkus. Scott Simkus. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah. Has a really good book called Outsider Baseball. Yes. And, and he's some, one of the men who I've never met, Scott. Simkus. He's going to be but, on here in another week or two. Yeah, we're well, that's great. Yeah. Tell him I said hello <laughs> and I haven't met him because I relied a lot on his research. He's one of the people really very responsible for the level of statistical information we have about the Negro Leagues today. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Seamheads, a lot of yes. Work on that. Yes. Yeah, Seamheads and other places. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott's work showed that um, Negro League in head-to-head in -head action, what you would consider a, a Negro Leagues team versus a, a, a major league team in terms of the National League or American League. Um, the Negro League team won more than 50% of those games. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, some of those NLAL teams were right. had a lot of triple uh, had a lot of minor league mm -hmm. players on them in these exhibition games. The more telling statistic might be that when you look at their uh, winning percentages against uh, military teams, college teams, minor league teams, and down the line, uh, the major league teams have a slightly higher winning percentage than the Negro League teams do at, at every level. Mm -hmm. So I, I always thought that was a good piece of evidence about what I was saying before about the rosters not probably not being as deep. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Negro Leagues teams as they were for, Amer for um, American League and National League teams. Um, and I know the guys who are working on the Major League equivalencies, the so-called MLEs, uh, try and translate Negro League statistics into mm -hmm. Major League stats. You know, find that you're downgrading. Uh, of course, again, it would go the other way, too, if you're doing it for <laughs> NLAO players with, mm -hmm. with uh, facing black competition. Um, you, you know, you lose points in your batting average mm -hmm. and everything else when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, but this is all a long, uh, all a long way to say <laughs> that uh, I think it's I think it's great that Baseball Reference and Major League Baseball are including Negro League statistics. We would not have been able to do it mm -hmm. uh, were it not for the ten or twelve people you you noted before <laughs> had spent decades collecting box scores mm -hmm. um, and recreating um, mm -hmm. the statistics that we didn't have even at the time. It's much easier for me to write a biography of Oscar Charleston today or anybody to do this kind of thing than it would have been the day Oscar Charleston died. Absolutely. Because our access to statistics and the record, the digitization of newspapers, um, all of that uh, is so much more advanced. You know, we mm -hmm. even then when he died, he was already his his prime years, from 20 or 30 years earlier, uh, he died in 1954. We're already fading into shadows because uh, there was no record you could go consult. There was no encyclopedia you could look up. Right. Um, there was no, the newspapers didn't print like his career. So just, they just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and we have it now better than we've ever had it. So if you are skeptical about this sort of thing, you need to realize, just realize that um, this is people just pulling numbers out of a hat or trusting what cool Papa Bell said about the number of home runs that Josh Gibson hit. This is being reconstructed from box mm -hmm. scores. Mm -hmm. It includes only major level competition. It doesn't include the, like you were saying before, the, the city club, or whatever. <laughs> so it, it's what we have for Negro League statistics is quite, are quite trustworthy. I think they're incomplete and they will always be incomplete, mm -hmm. but what we have are quite trustworthy. And um, they, they map on well to what contemporary observers, both white and black said about uh, the level of play they were witnessing in the Negro mm, Leagues. That's right. I mean, those are some great points. And, and that's why these conversations, I think, are important, because I'm trying to give that context to, to people who may not have that background knowledge, because it was a... I'm getting photobombed here. Um, <laughs> we're... Uh, we we do not have, nor will, like you just said, ever have the complete story. It, it, it's unfortunate. We just can't go back and do it uh, and, and get it at this point. But it, it's important to understand what was going on around those times because we're talking an era 100 years ago um, with 
uh, first the racial side of things with Jim Crow mm-hmm. and everything else that they dealt with um, that are, are you know, certainly something that are not, um, you know, we're not having today. And then um, uh, why they were barnstorming. Why were they playing the, the church club? They were making yeah. money. That was how yeah. they made money. And, and, and so, yeah. you know, th- there's, there's things. And, and why were they playing in certain towns? You talk about you're from Indiana. Uh, I had Jeremy Painter on here who wrote uh, several books on Indiana baseball. And, you know, Indiana was like the crossroads coming from east to west. I mean, many, many teams came through, traveled through Indiana and played. And that's why there's so many good players and teams that are from there, uh, just like Pittsburgh was. Why were they there? Because of the railroads, right? I mean, they yeah. traveled through the, you know, the, the areas. So all that context is important. So, uh, you know, one of the things I like about some of the books, like uh, I had Rob Ruck on here from uh, Sabre Author, they dig into... And they try to give that background, that that time period, what it was like, what the area was like, what the city was like, uh, and 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 all those things are great. I I hope people take the time to to check out some of these books that you guys are writing and and find out more about not just the statistics. There's more to the story. So, so tell us about this book. How long? <clears throat> I mean, it came out in 2019. So um, the I'm gonna put let me put it up here uh, at the bottom so you can. Um, so people can see the title. Um, because like I said, I totally agree with the sentiment of uh, being one of the more underappreciated uh, superstars. Because he was a yeah. superstar. There, there's no yeah. no doubt about it. So, so it right. came out in 2019. How long did it take you to do the research and put this all together? A few, a few years to do the research. Um, I think I started in earnest probably in 2014 or 2015. Oh, wow. Too okay. late, unfortunately, to uh, to have a lot of the conversations that you had or that Phil Dixon had and Larry Lester and everybody else. Yeah. Uh, with, with, I mean, I was able to talk to maybe six or seven or eight, something like that, maybe a couple more, uh, uh, still living uh, ex-Negro leaguers, but most of them, of course, had passed away mm-hmm. by 2014. Certainly the ones who knew Oscar. Mm-hmm. or had played with or under Oscar, uh, who had obviously died back in 1954. So, um, but I was able to do a little bit of that. And then mainly, um, we're fortunate, we have a lot of people have recorded a lot of these conversations, as you mentioned, and are willing mm-hmm. to share them. So you're able to profit from other people's research. Uh, one such man named John Shulian, who writes for, who, at the time, he wrote for Sports Illustrated. He's a, and it's a uh, really great sports writer. Also the co-creator of Xena Warrior Princess, which may or may not be of any interest to people <laughs> in the audience. Uh, he, John shared, he had done a piece on Oscar for Sports Illustrated around 2000. I uh, shared all his notes with me from that. So that I was sort of able to talk to Double Duty Radcliffe and people like that via John Trulian's notes. Um, and then, but the main thing is just digging through the newspapers from the time. Uh, mm-hmm. Day after day after day, reading every clipping in the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, and everything right. else. And now, as I said before, thankfully, thanks to the uh, digitization of the vast majority, I think it's fair to say, vast majority of newspapers, certainly the major newspapers um, that's happened just in the last 10 or 15 years, <clears throat> you can search. You don't have to go to like four, you know, 100 different libraries and search. Right. Through. You can just do it all from your computer with a couple of key subscriptions. So that was. That was the, the main way to, to know where Oscar was all the time and what was happening. And then the other big thing I had access to, thanks to John Shuley and I'm finding it out about it from him, really thanks to Larry Lester's work, is Oscar Charleston's personal scrapbook and personal photo album, uh, which he kept with his wife. And they are at wow. the museum in Kansas City. Uh, they're not available to the public uh, at this point. They're not like archived or indexed or anything, but um, you know, if you're nice to to um, Bob Kendrick and, and Ray Ray Doswell, <laughs> awesome. uh, you know, you can get a chance to look through them. So that really gave me a window into Oscar's um, personality more than I think I would have otherwise had. And what what did he think was important? Uh, what was he proud of? Who who were his friends? You know, um, there's a pictures of him with. Dolph Luque in Cuba, yeah, Oscar and his wife with Dolph Luque and his wife Dolph Luque, for those who don't know, um, pitched for the Reds, um, had a long career with the Reds as well as in Cuba as white, a white man. So mm. you get to see a kind of um, this sort of cross-racial friendship that you're able to have mm. in, in Cuba 
in a way you wouldn't have been able to have so much in, in Pittsburgh or wherever Oscar was at the time. Mm -hmm. So very, very cool uh, artifacts to Absolutely. have access to that really helped kind of recreate his story. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, that would have been fantastic to see. Now, I'm not sure how long it's out there. It sounds very familiar to uh, much of the work about Rube Foster recently. Uh, a lot of it came from a scrapbook that his family, I believe his son ah. or someone had kept, and they've actually have digitized that. Uh, really? I, I, think you, I think you can search it. It may even be on the Baseball Hall of Fame that you can okay. go on and, and you can check that out. And it yeah. is literally... Uh, cut out newspaper clippings his yeah. diary photos i mean it's fantastic stuff so i can only imagine what that one about oscar Charles. that's great was. i don't think that was available when i was doing my research in fact you're the first person to tell me about that i i, po I posted some of those up. things on twitter you you can you can okay. go there i i would try I, like i said i would search root foster uh scrapbook and the baseball hall of fame because i i'm pretty sure that they have the digitized copy of much of it if not all of it that's, yeah. that you can that's take. cool yeah it's very yeah i cool. don't it, it, Oscars is not digitized at this point. I do have Very neat. I've got photographs of every page of, of those artifacts, wow. and um, I'm willing to share. Anybody wants I to see Oscar scrapbook, let me know, and I'll I'll share you into the Dropbox folder where I have that stuff. I don't think anybody cares. I mean, uh, and, um, he <laughs> had a fascinating life. I mean, I know he he uh, he played. Uh, baseball in the military he was in world war yeah. one uh tell us a little bit about you know a little bit about his life story and, yeah and, yeah he was born uh oscar was born in 1896 uh october of 1896 william mckinley excuse me oscar <laughs> mckinley charleston named after william mckinley the uh republican presidential candidate that year he was running against william jennings bryan uh so his parents <laughs> You know, wow. uh, McKinley supporters, because uh, they gave Oscar uh, the middle name of McKinley. Uh, he was interesting. Yeah, he was the he was one of ten children that lived past infancy uh, to his his parents who were who had wow. moved up from Tennessee to Indianapolis just before uh, they had Oscar. Uh, very poor, um, not not atypically poor, I think probably for a large uh, black family um, who had just you know made. The Great Migration from mm -hmm. the South to the Midwest. Where did, at that where did they move from? Tennessee, Tennessee. near Nashville. Okay. Yes. Um, allegedly, uh, Oscar's father was like a handyman or contractor or something like that at Fisk College when W. Uh, e. B. Du Bois was there. Wow. Uh, uh, so they, yeah, one of uh, it was a poor family they moved almost every year. You can follow them in, in the city directories from one address to the next, just uh -huh. every year every year so he grew up in at least 10 12 different homes wow uh mainly on the near west side that's where uh iupui is today um it was that was the most um populated uh in um a black neighborhood in indianapolis uh called the indiana avenue neighborhood uh it's where oscar robertson would grow up later that's where madam uh cj taylor had her hair um Really, uh, empire hair product empire. Yeah, it's oh. there. So, it's, but all the houses in which Oscar lived are gone. Every 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 one of them. <laughs> uh, the, at least as far as I could find, urban renewal uh, it has done its work. That you know, freeways uh -huh. have come through, and so they're all gone. There's no there's no uh, physical um, uh, house still standing anywhere, unfortunately. But he, he grew up there, 18, and he, he was allegedly a bat boy for the Indianapolis ABCs, which was the leading black team in Indianapolis when he was a youth. Um, I think Oscar is the source of that information, which shows up in various snippet biographies later on in his life. I couldn't confirm that, mm -hmm. but probably true. And then when he was 15 years old, he had graduated, well, he graduated, he had completed the eighth grade um, and did not go on to high school. Uh, for he maybe was out of the HBA for a year or so, if I'm recalling correctly, and lied his way into the army. He was supposed to be 18 to join the army. He was 15, uh, but he was oh, able to wow. join. Either he forged uh, his parents' signatures, one of his parents' signatures, or they signed the papers for him. It's not. It's not clear. At 15, uh, wow. 15, yeah. Wow. So he goes off to the Philippines. So he's he. I'm sure he had never left Marion County. In the, I mean, I would be very doubtful that was the case. Uh -huh. He had a lot of his brothers and sisters. His brothers got into a lot of trouble. Three of his older brothers, some run-ins with the law. You know, spent some time in juvie. 
Uh, his, his oldest brother was a, a was a uh, champion city boxer. Um, Oscar never had any sort of trouble with the law, and that continues really throughout his whole life. Uh, despite some stereo- if you read some just hmm. things online, you might think he was a borderline psychopath or something, <laughs> or because he's always talked about how his temper, a lot of yeah, yeah. But that's very um, that's it's more complex than that. And he certainly did not have any trouble with like authority with the mm-hmm. law. Uh, quite quite the con- contrary mm-hmm. so um anyway though he he goes off to the military uh and um leaves his mark on him he goes he gets shipped to the philippines and he starts his baseball career in manila in the manila league which is like oh like a high a league you might say today mm-hmm. um and he is plays for the 24th infantry um team it's an all-black regiment of course mm-hmm. and they get they are able to get into the Manila League when I think it's the Marines leave. They ship out of the Philippines and so they're gone. So there's all Army team and all Navy team and all Native Filipino team and the 24th Infantry team. And he and Bullet Joe Rogan, who goes on to a Hall of Fame career as well, are on that team together. And Bullet Joe is 18. He's not known as Bullet Joe yet. And Oscar is 15. Wow. And they're by far the most talented people in that league. <laughs> That's why we today. Nobody else went on to great fame. Um, but they were just young kids then. Uh, they still acquitted themselves really well. And um, yeah, so he was playing integrated baseball in 19, uh, tw- 13, 19, yeah, 19, end of 1912, 1913, 1914 wow. in the Philippines. Um, Interesting. Some decade before uh, Jackie Robinson plays with the Dodgers. Right. And so. Um... The Negro National League is formed in 1920, and he is still right. he is still relatively young. Still young, 23 years yeah, old yeah, I mean, when that season starts. Yeah. So, but prior to that, he played um, for the Chicago American Giants, didn't he? Didn't he? With, with yeah, he starts. He comes National back League? to the. He gets out of the army, and he comes back home, and the ABCs sign him up, and they think he's going to be a pitcher because that's what he had really done in the Philippines. Played some center field, but he, he was a pitcher, the left-hander. And so uh, C.I. Taylor signs him up for the ABCs. I've got this new left southpaw, and he's good. He's okay pitcher, like mm-hmm. yeah, average. But he's so uh, he shows a lot of promise at the plate, and he's a great fielder. And so Taylor decides you're my center fielder, um, and so he only pitches like spot relief, spot starts from then on. So yeah, he starts with the ABCs, 1915 through. He, he skips the. It's a long. We don't go do every year. Yeah, right. Plays Manny with the ABCs, and then he goes with the Chicago American Giants in 1919, um, where the ABCs it looked like we're going to fold. They didn't, but CI Taylor was having some issues. So Rube Foster signs him for the American Giants, and Foster helps continue his development. And that's really when he becomes kind of a superstar mm-hmm. in 1919, um, because uh, the American Giants are the biggest team in the Midwest. Uh, Rube Foster is the biggest name in black baseball. Mm-hmm. He's the John McGraw of black baseball, right? And so Charleston gets a lot more press, a lot more development, uh, and a lot, just a lot more publicity then. So that's where things stand when the Negro National League starts in 1920. And to prove part of how Rube Foster proved that this was not just a thing for Rube Foster, uh, yeah. was to hold an open, to basically give Charleston back to the uh, ABC. Indianapolis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's. I'm glad you brought that up because you know, Rube Foster was a genius as well. I mean, when it came oh, to yeah. how he was able to, um, you know, uh, persevere and, and, and form the, the Negro National League in his career, and and he was a character on top of all that. But uh, but in 1920, when the Negro National League is formed, he he went out of his way. I mean, he kept the better players on on Chicago, of course, but yeah. he he went out of his way to make sure that there was some talent spread around because he he did he did go out of his way. That was a, it was the the maybe the best thing Rube ever did. You know? in a life that had a lot of good things he did for black baseball, but mm-hmm. trying to ensure a, a, a good bit of competitive balance in this new league was a gesture showing that he was serious about it. Yeah. This was just I mean, a, a vehicle Hill. for American Giants to make money. Yeah, Pete yeah. Hill and several others went and he uh, to play for Detroit, Detroit and, and yeah. Oscar Charleston back to Indianapolis. I mean, there was there was a lot of that, and that was really, I think, a great move because it, it, it grew the brand a little bit. And, and That's right. He was trying to grow the game. Go the brand. That's right, and yeah. and he had a a bigger vision than most um, leaders of uh, 
at least in the Negro Leagues at the time, had. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I don't think they thought this was possible. And Rube saw that it was possible, and they made it happen. So fast forward now, we're going to hit the 30s, where he really hits his stride as a, as a player, and certainly with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Um, yeah. and, and it was around this time when there was more and more of a push coming for integrating baseball. And I've right. read I've read articles over the years that uh, you know who was considered who who wasn't uh, mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing and then of course forty seven uh, took that long before it finally happened but he was on the short list I'm sure in the yeah uh, in he the would 1930s. get thirties yeah yeah I mean obviously we were never very close to integrating in the nineteen thirties probably but mm -hmm. um, he was there are stories for instance of yeah he'd get named let's put it this way the black yeah. press would put his name yeah. forward all the time yeah. and then guys like dizzy dean who played against charleston in a um uh, exhibition series after the gas house gang won the world series in 1934 you know would say that guy you know could be a hundred thousand dollar player in in the uh, you know national league today so he would get their players would step up and say things mm -hmm. at this time uh, some of the papers would put forward initiatives to try to um, uh, start to pressure, uh, you know, the National League and American League to integrate or sit, mm -hmm. basically just pressure some owner to sign somebody, right? Uh, there was one story uh, told about Charleston that there's, I think it was a Yankee scout at a game and said, you know, I wish, man, I wish we could sign you. And Oscar was like, well, why don't you? You know, and right? the scout, well, we both know why. Like, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's just how it was. But Charleston did play a role in the integration of the game. So even though he didn't, obviously he was, yeah, not really playing anymore by the time Jackie Robinson uh, mm -hmm. starts playing for the Dodgers. But he, uh, Branch Rickey, used him to scout black players for um, potential for potentially being signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. In fact, I think Charleston may have been the first. African American to be paid to scout for a, a National League or an American League team. Uh, he wasn't. It wasn't open. It wasn't. But uh, that's the story told by Clyde Soupforth. He was uh, Ricky's lead scout, mm -hmm. um, and by Roy Campanella, uh, who, whom Charleston had a big role in the Dodgers signing. Uh, Charleston was there was a new a Negro League started called the um, United States League, uh, and Ricky maneuvered to have a team placed in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. And then he maneuvered for Charleston to be the manager of that team, uh, which Charleston wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be managing the Philadelphia team in the league at that time. And then Sukeforth later tells us, yeah, we used Charleston to um, get to get background information that we couldn't get, to get, get into places we couldn't get um, and find out you know, what the real story was with some of these players. Like they thought Roy Campanella was lying about his age because he was like a huge human being at 16, 17 years old. Uh, and, you know, Charleston was able to tell them, no, it's, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's his real age and you should sign him. Um, Campanella gives him credit for that in his biography, autobiography, obviously ghost written um, or co-written by some, a ghost, mm -hmm. which is very characteristic of Oscar's luck, Oscar Charleston's luck, because Campanella in that book calls Oscar Charleston Oscar Robertson uh, and that's how it's been published all these years since it first came out in 1960 <laughs> but the big O had nothing to do with scouting Roy Campanella it was Oscar Charleston so he had others uh, I think Johnny Needlenose Wright and Roy uh, Partlow and some of the other early Dodgers signees not all of whom of course worked out but were signed to to Brooklyn Dodgers contracts I think Charleston there's there's at least good circumstantial evidence that he had a lot to do with the Dodgers uh, signing them so uh, when you look at him statistically, uh, and certainly now when you when you put him in with uh, Major League Baseball players, mm -hmm. one of the things I think, and I've had this um, mentioned to me several times with Negro League players, you try to look through the Baseball Reference site and you'll see literally, you know, 20, 30 teams sometimes listed for some of these players. Right. Uh, right. Because many of them did, uh, you know, and they were ahead of their time, right? This was free agency yeah. before there was free agency, right? Because baseball was. So this is what life looks like without the reserve clause. Yeah. I mean, you know, Major League Baseball was using the reserve clause. And and basically you were you were you were uh, owned by the team. You couldn't go anywhere, uh, you know. Yeah. So, New Year leagues, uh, you had a contract, but you know, 
it, it yeah. was you, you went where the well, money was. So well, Even if there was a contract, something like a reserve clause, or sometimes there was, it just the league just wasn't strong enough to right, prevent to re, to a lot of jumping. Yeah. So, so when you look at his career and you see uh, the number of teams he played for, because he, you know, yeah. as we've touched on some of these already, but he played in Cuba for a number of years in the 20s. He played in, yeah. in did he play in the Dominican as well? I think he did, right? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Just Cuba? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just Cuba. You know, but then he was on some of the greatest teams of all time. When you look at the, uh, you know, the St. Louis Giants, or the uh, when when they were in, in the twenties, the Homestead Grays in the thirties, the Crawfords, those Crawford teams in the mid mid thirties were just, uh, you know, how many All Stars were uh, yeah. Hall of Famers were on that? Well, at least five yeah. or six uh, Hall of Famers on those teams. And he was managing, and he was too, a player manager, point. right? I mean, so uh, you know, his body of work as a player. Uh, is just phenomenal. I, I think I saw in Baseball Reference in, in his major league seasons, which would be the the uh, seasons that he had in the Negro National League, um, I, 364 you know career batting average, which puts him right there near the top of of all time. I mean, so um, you know his body of work as a player, then as a manager, as you mentioned, as a scout. Uh, you yeah. know, he he certainly is someone who. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's maybe it's like I but Philip we asked it, it maybe it's one of the most impressive overall baseball it resumes is. ever right. put together because of those three things. It's not it, player wise. It, it's James Wright was either number four player of all time. Joe Posnanski says he's number five player of all time. Others say maybe maybe he's really only a top three player of all time. Either way, he's inner inner circle. Okay, and he's a five tool guy who was. I often say who is uh, you know Willie Mays before Willie Mays. He was a left-handed Mike yeah. Trout. He was uh, that's a good analogy. Barry Bonds, yeah. uh, you know, without the steroids. Yeah. Like there was a, those are the kinds of guys you would compare yes. him to. Um, five tool, you know, could light everything, run, field. I mean, he was an incredible mm -hmm. defender. In fact, I don't think Seamheads gives him enough credit for his defense, uh, just based on what I've read. Just nah, that's simply based on reputation. It seems like it doesn't quite line up statistically there. Great runner, great hitter, could hit for power. So yeah, you're right. He's got all of that. He's got this incredible five-tool profile as a player. Uh, ranks with those kinds of. Well, let me put it this way: no, nobody in the National League or American League, anyway. Uh, last time we looked on Baseball Reference, had a, a career batting average of 300 or greater, 300 home runs or more, and 300 stolen bases. Uh -huh. No one. Charleston undoubtedly would have done that. He had at least Seamheads has him as. And this is in fewer than half the plate appearances of Mays. Uh, 350 batting average, 191 home runs, 300 stolen bases. And that's half the plate appearances of Mays. 300 stolen bases. And base. Charleston was durable, totally durable. So it's, it's hard to believe he wouldn't have uh, eclipsed 300 homers, maybe four or 500 stolen bases, and hit a some, somewhere north of 300. Uh, and he would be the only guy ever to have done and that. We've already touched on this a little bit already, but the fact that these guys were doing a lot of barnstorming, uh, playing in, yeah. in uh, Mexico and Cuba in, in the Dominican Republic, um, the Negro, Negro League seasons tended to only be uh, max 60, 70, 80 games, if, if many of the teams yeah. even played that many. Official games. You know, even right. if, they, if they played yeah. that many. Now, they played many more games than that when you count in all right. of the competition. But uh, right. So, yes, yeah, so his documented statistics are impressive uh, mm -hmm. in the totals, and they probably would be, like you pointed out, that much more had he been able, had he played in a, in a, in a uh, structured 154-game yeah. season in a major league franchise. And and wasn't playing all winter in Cuba to make to make more money, maybe, right. you know. Yeah. So I mean, we know, but mainly we, we assume that statistics are going to go down when you when you face major league pitching. But we know he, he hit Lefty Grove well. Yes. Uh, he hit um, uh, Dizzy Dean. I mean, in, in against major league pitching, he, hit he held his own more than better than he did against major league pitching. He hit 355 with a 420 on base and a 738 slugging percentage. Amazing. Uh, and that's in 158 plate appearances. That's not too many, but what we have, what we know, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you take into account, like unlike Mays or Bonds and those guys, he managed. He was a manager yes. by the time uh, he was 27 years old, the Harrisburg Giants in 1924. Uh, mainly managed for the rest of his life, uh, with a couple of exceptions. He didn't manage the Homestead Grays. Um, and for a while he was a coach with the Philadelphia Stars in the early 40s. Mm -hmm. But um, he also managed, this is something interesting I found, 
during World War II, he was kind of out of the game, and he got a job with called the Quartermaster Depot in South Philadelphia. It was a, a factory making uh, supplies uh, for um, to support the war effort, and had a team. Everybody had a baseball team back in those mm-hmm. days, right? This would be 1942, 43. Uh, he, um, the team was in the Industrial League, like a semi-pro league in Philadelphia, and it was an integrated team. It was black uh, guys, white guys together on the team. Awesome. And Charleston, Charleston was the manager of that team. He wasn't just playing for an integrated team in 1942. Awesome. He had only some pro. Yeah. He was the manager of that team. <laughs> Craig was very proud of that. He had a lot of clippings of photos and articles about that team in his um, awesome. scrapbook. And, and photo album so you know i don't know was there did anybody at any level did, did, was, is there an african-american who managed an integrated team before 1942 no probably if, not if, if there is somebody <laughs> needs to tell me about it because i think he might have been the first to do that too mm-hmm. yeah i mean his, his body of work um is is just i mean more people do need to know about him now he is in the baseball hall of fame he was yes. uh uh, he was put in with the uh, uh, the Negro League. Uh, I think I want to say it was 19. Was it 74, or six? Somewhere? 76. 76. When he got in. Yeah. So, um, and obviously the first ones to go in were Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, and Cool Papa Bell. And I think then I think him. I think I think they were the first four. I'm yeah, he was up to Monty Irvin, mm-hmm. um, Gibson, Page, and maybe somebody else, uh, Buck Leonard, maybe or somebody like that before him. But what? only I think he's the fifth guy in. So how much in your book do you touch on him, um, you know, as a, as what, what was he like? I know you talked about, you know, yes, I have read some of those stories about, uh, you talk uh, about, uh, and, and again, some of that was stereotypical that was said about a lot of Negro League players, you know, out uh, here, you know. Well, even more than that, it was just like white and black, there was just more violence in A, baseball, and B, American society 120 years ago than there is. so, right? Yeah. People just you got in bar fights. Nobody gets in a bar fight anymore, right? Yeah. And then, eh, you know, get a fight, it's not such a big deal. Um, yeah. So some of it is stereotype, I think. You're right in terms of his race, but um, he was not, I, but I, what I like to say, he was, he was intensely competitive on the diamond. So, you know, like a Michael Jordan meets Pete Rose kind of competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, a kind of competitiveness we don't really see that much anymore, I might add. Right. At least, at least, uh, at least on the surface, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was really competitive. Mm-hmm. And it, again, it was just a more uh, violent time. I mean, mm-hmm. people got in fights a lot. Babe Ruth got suspended for hitting an umpire, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this, it just happened. Um, but he, he got in a particularly uh, um, publicized uh, fight and he cre- he really made a mistake his rookie year for the ABCs the end of the season they're playing an exhibition series against a white all star team in Indianapolis put together by Donnie Bush of the Detroit Tigers Donnie was from Oni as he was called was from Indianapolis and would go on to become a good friend of Oscar Charleston but anyway um, Bush stole second uh, he was called safe the ABCs were sure that he was out uh, second baseman gets in a shoving match with the white umpire. Charleston runs in from center field and slugs the umpire. Oh Dexter. my God. And that's like kind of crossing a line, uh, even in 1915. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly crossing a racial line in 1915. So that there's a riot or near riot is as described. I by the bet, paper. right? Yeah, and it really embarrassed C.I. Taylor, the manager of the ABCs, who mm-hmm. was um, very much a military man himself, a college man, mm-hmm. and was all about uh, you know behaving properly to mm-hmm. to um, create pathways for um, social advancement for African Americans in, mm-hmm. in, in no. Indianapolis. This this didn't seem to help things. So that kind of got that's where the the hothead sort of uh, myth gets started with Charleston. And he certainly gets into some other fights as the years go on, but almost never is the guy starting them. More like joining in. <laughs> um, you know, not 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 always the case. There's another there's enough altercation with an umpire here and there, but. It's not like all the time. And there were worse guys. Like Charleston was really, really well liked. He was very popular, very charismatic. Mm-hmm. He was described by um, even the, the Negro League players I was able to talk to uh, as friendly, as as, um, as as charming, as uh, uh, like a father figure. Like people people liked Charleston. Uh-huh. They, they, not, not everybody, but the vast majority of people liked they were charmed by him. He um moved, he was able to make friends with people like higher up in society. Like he was very conscious of moving up um, into the the talented tent. 
let's say. His, his wife was very accomplished, both of his wives, um, but the Janie, the one that he was married to for a very long time, till he, till he died. Uh, it, yeah, there, there's examples all over the place, um, befriending, you know, uh, from Dolph Luque to uh, accomplished businessmen in Cuba and that sort of thing. So um, he, well, he, had a, he had a very charismatic personality. He was intensely competitive on the field and he would do anything to get that base in mm -hmm. front of him <laughs> but he was not a it was not like a thug or a psychopath or any of the kinds of things that you sometimes are implied by people who haven't really looked into the matter that's right uh so just trying to sum this up for people uh, he is a top player of all time in any major league uh considered yes. by um you know some of the um uh, you know the fathers of Father of sabermetrics, Bill James, uh, as, as the number four player of all time, He's, he certainly is is a top player. He managed. He uh, was a scout. Now, I, I think didn't he? I, I, I thought I read somewhere towards the end of his career. And this is after the Crawfords folded, um, and and didn't he get into actually even owning or part owner of a team as well? He, a, he may have owned. I I believe you're, uh, he owned a piece of the Crawfords once they moved to Toledo. Actually, once they, they started splitting their time between Toledo and Indianapolis, I believe that's because Charleston put up some, some money to any, it was a part owner of the team. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, so he had a hand in so many, yeah. in so many things when it comes he, to... Even umpired for a couple of years in the did, Negro National League in the mid-40s. So. Did he really? Yeah. yeah. No and kidding. No one, him. no one would mess with him. Just he one was, look, in they the would Negro, say, you would back your dugout. In the Negro <laughs> National League, he becomes an umpire. Yep. Wow, yep. that yep. is cool. So he when was, was that? After in the uh, mid, late 40s? 40, uh, yeah, when it, it was after the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers thing had fallen apart, I believe. So 46, 47. Uh -huh. And then 48, he comes wow. back as the manager of the Philadelphia I... Star. And then he manages them and the Indianapolis Clowns at the end of his life. He could not get away from the game. He was a total lifer. He had not, there was nothing else you know, that he wanted to do, I think, other than be part of the game. And he would do whatever it took to do that. So um, towards the end of his life, he had a couple of little tragedies that, that befell him, right, as well? I mean, what, what, what happens at the end of his life? Didn't he have an accident or something happened? Well, there? right, that's, and that's kind of how he dies. I mean, I, the, the main tragedy is his separation from his wife. We talk about personal tragedy because Janie was a rock solid figure in his life. Um, and we do not know why exactly they were separated, but maybe that uh, had to do with other with them, um, you know, affairs and things like that. Um, but uh, they never divorced. Uh, but yes, in 1954, he just has uh, won another championship, and this is the Negro American League, and this is our the last right. days of the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. But the Clowns win under his leadership. Interesting. And uh, he goes back to his Philadelphia home in Strawberry Mansion neighborhood of Philadelphia, and he falls down a set of stairs that we're told wow. and he had a stroke or something but in any case uh and he, he's paralyzed from the waist down so he wasn't even 60 years old at this time right i mean he was he not was... he was 57 years old wow now his death certificate says he died from uh cancer of, of the plasma uh, i forget exactly what oma that is <laughs> um but so i'm piecing that all together i'm not exactly sure was it was it a stroke? Was it? Did he fall because of the cancer? It made him. I don't know exactly. I did find a newspaper clipping. Joplin, Missouri. He had been admitted to the hospital when the clowns were out there in a um, barn. You know, playing like you were saying before. They were playing the Monarchs in Joplin, Missouri. Just yeah, barnstorming. Uh, he had been admitted to the hospital. Just in the hospital, in just like in that section of the paper, like you know, hospital news, like wow. Oscar Charleston, Indianapolis, admitted, um, and then he got out a couple of days later. So he must have been sick that year, that 19, year of 1954, um, probably with this cancer. Um, uh, but exactly how those pieces fit, I don't know. But yeah, it was a, a tragic end, and he was, was far too young. Um, Absolutely. And had he lived longer, we would all know about him more, I believe. Because if he had lived another 20 years, let's say, um, by that time, guys like Robert Peterson and others were starting to really do history on the Negro Leagues. And he would have talked to him and gotten his story, you know. And instead, he's gone. He has no descendants. He's estranged from his wife. And there was really nobody to tend his flame, you know, oh, to tell his boy. story. 
And so I guess part of the reason why he kind of got lost, whereas other figures like Cool Papa Bell, who lives a nice long life and is able to give a ton of interviews, um, you know, become, uh -huh. he has a great yeah. nickname too, uh, becomes uh, so much better now, even though Charleston was much better player than Cool Papa Bell, no one would disagree with that. Certainly because of the power and everything else, yeah. yeah. Boy, oh boy, you know, that's a great point. I never, um, you know, I, I've had on, uh, like I said, numbers of authors, and I'm always surprised when I hear the number of players, and it's not just Negro League players, but um, right. the number of players who wind up at the end of their life in an unmarked grave, or in a, or yeah. in a, uh, uh, you know, in a very, very nondescript ending to what was a pretty uh, interesting and storied life in a, in a lot of uh, cases, yeah. and I, I, it always is amazing to me. I, it's a different time, I guess, we're talking about here, and it's yeah. probably why. But yeah. um, certainly this one, and like I said, the title of your book, uh, I think, is. Is pretty much sums it up. I mean, Oscar Charleston, the life and legend of baseball's greatest forgotten player. I mean, I think that pretty much uh, it tells it like it is. <laughs> so, uh, so where? Thanks for you. <laughs> yeah. So where where can people find that? Uh, it's on Amazon. Where where else yeah. you got it? You got you, yeah. You try not to buy it from Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos doesn't need any more of your money. Right. Now so you've try. got now you've got a website, right? OscarCharleston.com, right? OscarCharleston.com, which I, I haven't posted uh, uh, very faithfully on in recent months, but um, you can read more there if you just want a timeline of his life and some some basic information. Uh, and yeah, buy the book anywhere you want. If you could not buy it from Amazon, that's that's good for America. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's there if you want to buy it from Amazon. Um, yeah, and that's that's pretty much it. All right. So you got what else you got going on? You um, you're involved in some other things, right? I mean, you're involved in uh, some philanthropic uh, organizations. That is my, that is my day job. I have a, a, a firm called American Philanthropic that helps nonprofits grow. Um, so yeah, philanthropy and fundraising and fun things like that are things I, I usually am thinking about at 1.32 on a Tuesday here in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> it's nice not to be. Nice to be thinking about baseball for a little bit. Now you, uh, you but, mentioned yeah. you, you've, you've recently spoken with uh, Sean Gibson with the Gibson Foundation? Yes, I recently did one of their, uh, I was one of the um, webinars, whatever they call them in their series they're doing uh, for the foundation uh, awesome. to celebrate uh, the Negro Leagues, uh, and for the Josh Gibson MVP campaign, it's part of all that. So good people. Awesome. Yeah, they really, really are. I, I had Sean on. Uh, he was one of the first ones I had on back, I think, in February as well. And that was when I found out all, all about that uh, campaign. And at the time, I mean, they came to him really uh, the year before, uh, after they took Kennesaw Mountain Landis's name yeah. off. I think most people wouldn't even know. Kennesaw Mountain Lance, his name was even on the award. Yeah, yeah, that was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, yeah, yeah but interesting, um, you know, that, that goes back to uh, kind of what we, how we started this whole thing. I mean, some of these stories, some of the guys who had the keys to the kingdom, like Kennesaw Mountain Landis and, and uh, um, the sporting news, uh, you know, sometimes the way that the stories were told or not told uh, had a lot mm -hmm. to do with some of the ways that the Negro Leagues were perceived or not perceived. So, right. Uh, right. Now you 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 were traveling. You, you went down to Mexico. You told me right before uh, you're working on another book now. I'm trying to. I haven't gone down to Mexico yet. That's oh you that's haven't. Okay. I need to. Yeah. I'm I'm working now. It's not a baseball book. It's a biography okay. of another forgotten person, uh, a an explorer and and Franciscan missionary named Francisco Garces, who is in posted in southern Arizona in the late 1700s. It was kind of a a one man Lewis and Clark in, in his explorations of the Southwest. So, wow. So did you, you, you kind of stepped on that um, since you moved to Arizona? Is that how you yes, found that? Yes, exactly. My in interest in Southwestern history. Well, it, it's interesting, that. right? How you, um, I don't know, everybody, like, like I said, that origin story to me is fascinating. And, and, and like I said, that you just never know where things take you and how you meet, right. you know, how you, what. I just find it fascinating, and and yeah. and like I said, I, I really appreciate all of you. I, I appreciate this book and and what the work you put in on this. I hope people uh, check it out because it's it's a story that I think more people need to uh, uh, need to know about because he uh, he certainly is 
one of the greatest and probably one of the least known because everybody knows about Satchel Pages and Josh Gibson and you know right. then the next tier I guess would be a cool Papa Bell uh, Buck Leonard maybe I mean right. I think Buck Leonard maybe yeah. even falls into the same list as Oscar Charleston another maybe superstar so. you know yeah. and, and so I, I'm hoping as more of these stories come out and more research is done and I'm trying to get more people interested yeah. Uh, I'm trying to have younger people on. Plenty. I had on uh, Vanessa Vanessa uh, Ivy Rose, who's the uh, granddaughter of Turkey Stearns. He, oh, he's, that's fantastic. He's, he's definitely another one, like uh, oh, yeah. that tier of Oscar Charleston's, who's one of the greats of all time. Who One of the uh, top ten Negro League players of all yes, time, probably. And people Turkey have Stearns. no idea who he is. And so trying to get younger people to um, take a look at this, because it's all yeah. around you. The history of this... Uh, not just baseball history, but uh, you know, Negro League history, the barnstorming aspect, yeah. the stories, the players, it's there. Just look around. So yeah, uh, it's easier to find now than ever. So that's the good news, right? It's easier to find now than ever. That's yeah. right. I I appreciate you doing this and taking the time. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I, I I learned a lot more about Oscar Charleston than I knew. I was, <laughs> I try to I try to put something out every single day. Are you on Twitter at all? You, I am not. Twitter? I have yeah. decided social media is not for me. So yeah, sometimes it could be. <laughs> I'll share it on LinkedIn. <laughs> it, it could be a little annoying sometimes. Yes, I try to yeah. ignore, you know, most of it, uh, and yeah. just keep Good keep on tr keep on you know keeping on. You know, that's about all you can do. Yeah. But um, I try to put out something every day about players, and and uh, I will certainly, like I said, follow up with this and and some of the things we've talked about and, and, and let people know about your book and they want to check out more about Thank Oscar you. Charleston and uh, I think uh, anything else you're working on down the road just let me know I, I will do that thank you so much for having me on I appreciate it alright Jeremy you have a great day you too take care alright bye bye